Now to what appears to be a growing tug of war between the White House and Capitol Hill. Today we saw the divides highlighted on two fronts, health care and sanctions against Russia. For a closer look at both, we are joined now by our own Lisa Desjardins and Nick Schifrin. And we welcome both of you. So, Lisa, to you first uh, and Congress. There does seem to be a little bit of bipartisanship breaking out, but it's not from the leadership. It's from other members. What's going on? That's right. The death of a partisan leadership-led effort last week has given birth to bipartisanship in both chambers. Let's start with the House, Judy. In the House, we saw yesterday a group of 40 members called the No Problems or the Problem Solvers Caucus, half from each party, propose a health care compromise to stabilize the markets, essentially add more fund, but also limit the mandate on employers so fewer businesses would actually have to pay for insurance for their employees. That's the House. On the Senate side, Judy, the entire ballgame rests with Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, the chairman of the Health Committee, and his Democratic ranking member, Patty Murray, talk to both of their staffs today. They will have hearings. They're going to have a lot of conversations this month. The efforts on both sides, Judy, are narrowly tailored on stabilization, but they think that could be where there's agreement. So, but if they were not to agree, what would that mean for these insurance markets and for the cost of premium? That's right, for all of us, and especially those on the individual market. We got some new data yesterday from the Department of Health and Human Services. Let's look at the states that might get hit the hardest by increasing premiums. This is what insurers think they're forecasting they would have to do. Increase premiums by 30% in these five states, Judy. Notice something else those states have in common. Those were all states won by President Trump. These are red states. That's the high end, Judy, but most states do expect premium increases, for example, 12% in New York. It's something that's a real concern. And to get, I guess, to the politics of this, yeah. how much of these premium increases are due to the Affordable Care Act, which is what Republicans argue, and how much is due to just the instability of the markets and so forth, which is what Democrats are saying? This is the conversation, and it centers around those insurance subsidies, the $7 billion this year that insurers are counting on getting, good policy or not, they're expecting it, but President Trump hasn't yet said if he will let that money go all the way through for next year. That creates risk, and some people say that's why these premium increases are coming. But let's talk to, let's hear from Senator John Cornyn, Republican on the floor today. He said that Republicans and the president have nothing to do with premium increases. The idea that premiums are going to go up 30 percent next year unless something changes is a product of the failure of Obamacare. It's nothing that this administration has done or will do that has caused that. And that flies in the face, though, Judy, of what we've heard from states. Just one example, let's go to Idaho. The Republican director of insurance put out this statement exactly saying the opposite, saying that the increase there in the silver plans were, quote, due to the potential refusal of the federal government to fund the cost share reduction that is the subsidies. He's saying that is why they have at least some of the premium problem in that state. So just quickly, where is this headed? Right. There is a huge divide between, it looks like, senators, Republican senators who want to fund these insurance subsidies and a president who hasn't declared what he's going to do, but whose senators I talked to today, very nervous that he may not fund these subsidies. And we'll see uh, how many days are left for Congress to be around, and then we'll find out uh, how they work this out. So while we're talking about a division here, Nick, to foreign affairs, there's also a, a split that burst into the open today uh, when it came to these Russia sanctions. What's going on with regard to that? Yeah, this is the first major foreign affairs legislation passed by Congress. And not only was it passed over the president's objections, but it was also passed as a way to kind of handcuff the president's ability to lift sanctions on Russia. No president is going to like that. And in that sense, this is kind of part of a centuries-old tug of war between the legislative and executive branches over who controls foreign policy. And President Trump released an initial statement this morning that really speaks to that history. He said, my administration will give careful and respectful consideration to the preferences expressed by the Congress and will implement them in a manner consistent with the president's constitutional authority to conduct foreign relations. And the congressional staffers I spoke to today say that is language that Presidents Obama and Bush could have used, presidents trying to keep control over foreign policy. But he went further, as you and I were discussing, and he issued a second statement, much more personal. Oh, yes. This is a president who has a book called The Art of the Deal, who thinks that he is the best deal maker and does not want Congress to impede that. And the second statement he released simultaneously 
did go more personal toward Congress. He said Congress could not even negotiate a health care bill, healthcare bill after seven years of talking. I built a truly great company worth many billions of dollars. That is a big part of the reason I was elected. As president, I can make far better deals with foreign countries than Congress can. Now, on the Hill, you have some initial shrugs today. A uh, Democratic staffer told me, can you quote me rolling my eyes? Uh, Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Bob Corker said, it doesn't matter to me what the president's statement says. Uh, and that sentiment was actually taken a lot further by Russia. In its response, Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev said that Trump was, quote, weak and had been, quote, outwitted and humiliated by Congress, which just goes to show, Judy, that it's not just America that is watching this tug of war ouch. between the president and Congress. Ouch, ouch. So divisions over domestic and foreign, uh, and thank you both very much. Nick thank Schifrin, you. Lisa Desjardins.